right, this is an overview video of period three for the APUSH exam. Let's get started. The European conflict most certainly was at the heart of the movement towards independence. One could argue that independence was just another step of the natural growth of the modern nation state. British encroachment into Western lands was in direct conflict to the French presence in North America. The French cooperation with the natives tied the two groups together, and as a result, most would fight alongside the French. The French and Indian, or Seven Years' War, would be fought to decide, among other things, control of the North American eastern seaboard and the Ohio River Valley. Participation in the European conflict by American colonists further helped to solidify a national identity. Colonists started to feel more connected to each other than to their parent state. The colonists were proud of their military contribution to the war effort. British officers and regulars actually squawked at this, further insulting the colonists. The issue, however, would be overshadowed by the change in the economic relationship between the colonies and Britain that occurred after the French and Indian War. The economic system of mercantilism was first employed for the purpose of developing colonies while ensuring that they support the parent state as well. First tobacco, but later other raw materials such as sugar and cotton made their way to England. In fact, legal transactions of these raw materials almost exclusively made their way to England. Smuggled goods and a sense of salutary neglect kept the colonists complacent, despite their emergence as an economy of their own. So a national identity took hold with social bonds and economic bonds. Despite this, there was no overwhelming desire to break from England. In fact, even as late as 1776, roughly one-third of colonists would have supported a split from England. Most probably would have preferred a return to salutary neglect. The political nature of the rhetoric used by those most vocal for American independence added to the colonial unity that emerged against Great Britain. In an attempt to control the expansion of the colonial population, as well as for the purpose of financing the war, the British government issued the Proclamation of 1763. The Sugar Act enforced mercantilism as merchants importing French sugar now had to pay a tax. This was lower than the previously charged tax, but they had more difficulty circumventing it outright through smuggling. The Stamp Act of 1765 would unite the masses in all, as all persons, regardless of the position of wealth, would be forced to pay the tax for their paper goods. The Stamp Tax provoked such a response that the Stamp Act Congress was formed, and by the date the act was to take place, nearly all stamp tax collectors had been run out of town. Cries of no taxation without representation were common, as colonists barked at the claim that they were virtually represented in Parliament. While the Stamp Act was repealed, British issuance of the Declaratory Act added to the colonial vigor and emerging anti-British sentiment. Britain accepted defeat on the Stamp Tax, but declared its position in the clearest of terms. The American colonies were, and would continue to be, the subjects of the King under the status quo. Acts like the Sugar Act and Stamp Act actually democratized the revolutionary zeal. Colonial unity was enhanced through boycotts of British goods. Notably, after the Townsend Acts, tax collectors were tarred and feathered by colonial organizations such as the Sons of Liberty. Clinging to the belief that as British subjects they should enjoy the rights of British citizens, the colonists rejected virtual representation and hated the writs of assistance. Evidence of the escalation of the conflict between Britain and her colonies can be seen with events such as the Boston Tea Party and Britain's response with the Coercive Acts. Enlightenment ideas had made their way into the minds of colonists through the 18th century. In common sense, Thomas Paine called for the creation of a new kind of political society, specifically a republic, where power flowed from the people themselves. This further democratizes the movement towards independence. The Declaration of Independence included the words of John Locke with the concept of natural rights to life and liberty. The language put an American spin on the right to property and instead procured the right to pursue happiness. Regardless of the very democratic and republican nature of colonial government, the first national government would be created intentionally weak. It created a confederation of republican states with a national congress at the heart. It was all but impractical as a unifying government and had serious deficiencies within. There was no standing army, which proved to be a problem with Western rebellions, such as Shays' Rebellion. The responsibility of dealing with that was left to each state. One true accomplishment of the Articles Confederation would be the organization of the Northwest Territory. 
So, beginning in the spring of 1787, 55 men set about to revise the Articles Confederation. What they did was scrap it all together. The new government they drafted contained three branches, with the legislative branch at the core. Despite the federal nature of the governmental structure, the national government would in fact be a centralized government that would slowly assert its authority over the states. Compromise was at the heart of the new constitution. This was a logical byproduct of the democratic nature of the framers' world. The first compromise defined representation in Congress. Naturally, the Virginia plan supported larger states, and the New Jersey plan the small states. The Great Compromise, created by Roger Sherman here in Connecticut, solved this debate and created a bicameral system that we currently have, the lower house based on population and the upper house based on equal representation. In addition, there was a compromise regarding slave populations and their impact on representation in the lower house, as well as an agreement to keep the slave trade off the table until 1808. It may have been the compromise on the Bill of Rights, however, that most impacted the fate of the Constitution. Anti-Federalists such as Patrick Henry feared tyranny and usurpation of the people's rights. The pledge by Madison and other Federalists to include a codified safeguard of basic rights of Americans led the Anti-Federalists to support the Constitution as well as the eventual ratification of the document. George Washington, as first president, would set precedent for the office and for the nation. His two-term tradition persisted until the Great Depression and FDR. His advice for staying out of foreign affairs was not fully abandoned until the 19th century. His warning against political parties, however, would not be followed for quite so long. Two parties emerged largely related to four main issues. They disagreed as to the power of the federal government and on economic and foreign policy. Furthermore, the balance between liberty and order created a divide between the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans. Their proposal for a Bank of the United States revealed the ideological divide between the two parties. Democratic Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson, took a strict interpretation of the Constitution, while the Federalists, under Hamilton, took a loose interpretation of the Constitution. The Federalists argued that as the Constitution did not explicitly permit a national bank, it certainly also did not prohibit it either. Ultimately, the Federalists would win this battle over the constitutionality of the Bank of the U.S., and as such, chart the course of the nation. However, the victory of Thomas Jefferson in the election of 1800, and the peaceful transfer of power which resulted from this, did signify a victory for the system itself. A government with rebellious roots, yet built with democratic and republican ideals, survived its first significant test. The framers had succeeded in creating a government by and for the people that could sustain itself without violating those principles. The American Revolution was a struggle between colonial autonomy and imperial reform. Conflict between Britain and her colonies escalated and led to the polarization of the people. The slow shift towards imperial reform began with the Proclamation of 1763 after the French and Indian War. British Revenue Acts hurt colonists' pockets and begat political cries for representation in Parliament. Decades of self-rule and a belief in Enlightenment ideas unified the colonies and encouraged defiance and resistance towards the parent state. Before defeating the British on the battlefield, the new nation set out to create a permanent new Republican-style government. This American government drew upon English traditions, but certainly Americanized them as well. While not a perfect system, the Constitution created a government that drew its authority from the consent of the people. Furthermore, it brought dissent into the fray rather than shutting it out. Interestingly, perhaps the loudest proponent of Republican idealism would instead run the office of the presidency, more like the Federalists he previously opposed. That's it for this Period 3 review. Hope you enjoyed that. Looking forward to May 11th. It'll be fine. Take care.